Brother Martin High School and the University of New Orleans. He's a sports director at WWL TV Channel 4, where he's worked for the last decade. He was named sports director in 2012. Among the many awards he's accrued, the Master's Award from the New Orleans Broadcasting Hall of Fame and 12 first place awards from the Press Club of New Orleans. The Saints, of course, have a bye week before hosting Carolina, a week from Sunday. Please give a very warm Gordon New Orleans Sports Foundation Quarterback Club. Welcome to Doug Mouton of WWL TV. All right, first of all, I'm not crazy about the order of speakers. Following Ronnie is literally impossible. Uh, let me say this first. Um, congratulations to the Wisniewskis. I've known Mark and Stacy literally my whole life. Uh, Mark and I went to first grade together. We started playing at Kerry Curley Playground in New Orleans East at five years old, full pads. Um, anyway, I, I have a senior in high school too. Congratulations to them. I'm a huge fan of Mark's and the job he's done for a long time at Brother Martin. I couldn't be prouder of him as a lifelong friend. So congratulations to the Wisniewskis. I wanted to say that first. Uh, okay, I am just back from San Diego, so a couple of observations on what was a wild Saints game. This is, look, for everybody in this room, for any of us who care about sports, who watch, who follow, who make livings uh, in the sports world, this game literally is why we do this. Because as much as you think you might know, and as much as you watch and think you understand what's happening, sometimes lightning strikes in the fourth quarter and things completely flip around. Um, the way that game ended was one of the most unpredictable and literally just fun things to see that I can say I've seen in a long time. And look, I know they're one and three. I grew up, my dad was an original season ticket holder. I think one of the lessons I learned as a kid is you enjoy the wins, right? At least for a few days, don't think so much about long term, enjoy the wins. And for Sunday, the smiles in that place, look, I'll tell you this too. The first thing that I do on Monday mornings, we do a, a show at 10.30 on Sunday nights called Fourth Down on Four. And the first thing I do on Monday mornings is check the TV ratings, right? Be, and we get them every day, and sometimes they make you smile, and sometimes, you know, you shrug your shoulders and say you come back next week. And the TV ratings in the New Orleans metro area are so tied to how the teams do. It's, it's not even... Like, the, the, the correlation is perfect. And this week, Tulane had a spectacular win. LSU had a great first effort under Ed Ogeron. And the Saints win with lightning striking in the fourth quarter. Our ratings were literally double what they normally are. And it was fun to see. Um, it, it was just good stuff. Now, first of all, I can say about the stadium. People talk about the, about the Superdome and the age of the Superdome. The Superdome is the most state-of-the-art, uh, uh, modern place compared to the stadium in San Diego. This stadium in San Diego, built in 1967, it's round like the Superdome to fit baseball. Literally the worst NFL stadium that I've seen in at least the last seven or eight years. The video screen, in, one video screen in the end zone, so if you're in that end zone, you get no replays in a game. It's about 10 years ago, television converted from 4x3 screens to the 16x9, the wider. It's still a 4x3, it's the only 4x3 screen you'll ever see. And it's in the stadium where you're paying $100 for a ticket. It's a 4x3 screen and it's tiny. Um, Mike Neighbors from CST, it, you know, most places call it a Jumbotron. He dubbed it the Junior Tron. It's a tiny little monitor in the middle section, like a middle third of the scoreboard. It's an old stadium that it, I actually appreciate the Superdome a whole lot more because the new video walls are terrific. Now most NFL stadiums have different rules about getting down on the field. Uh, some places allow the people covering the game to be on the field for the final two minutes. Superdome doesn't allow us on the field at all until long after the game. In San Diego, I think the rule was the last two minutes, but at some point when you're in the press box, you have to get in an elevator and go down to the field. And this was one where I really we knew they were going to open up the field. It was one I wanted to see the end of, even though when I got on the elevator, the Saints were down 13 and punting. That's when we decided to get on the elevator, because you sure it sure looked over at that point. We got off the elevator, and actually one of the Spanoses, I think it was the owner's son, was walking in front of us. So Mike Neighbors and I from CST kind of walked close enough behind him 
where it looked like we might be with him. So when the security backed up to let him on the field, we just went on the field too for the final five minutes of the game. And I gotta tell you, the final five minutes of that game on the field was really something in the sense that, especially behind the Saints bench, there were thousands of Saints fans. Now look, the stadium holds 70,000. There were at least 15 or 20,000 empty seats. This is a, a city that's hoping to keep their NFL team. And no exaggeration, in the final five minutes of that game, you heard more cheering when the Saints did something than when the Chargers did. And the Chargers didn't do a lot in the final five minutes. But the noise from the Saints fans, it literally sounded like a home game. It was unbelievably impressive the turnout from New Orleans at that game, and every player we talked to in the locker room talked about it. I know it's cliched, and I, I, I felt bad, like I was pandering, including it in my story, but it literally made a difference. And you could feel the energy on the field. There was an explosion of emotion from the players. Sean Payton talks about a lot about changing the culture of the locker room. Look, 2014, that locker room was a cancer. It was horrible. It was uh, just the feeling in there was so toxic. I can't even describe it to you. We would go post-game and there'd be two guys who would talk to you every game post-game. It was Zach Streif and it was Ben Watson. And everybody else would go the opposite way. They would No, Drew Brees has to talk. He goes in front of the podium. But of the rest of the team, those were the only two guys. And they stood there game after game when the defense is giving up crazy amounts of yards, and they had to answer the questions, and they did. And those two guys I'll always respect for doing that when, when the rest of that locker room was just horrific. They talk a lot about changing the culture. I can tell you, the locker room is not like that now. It is not. It is the character in the locker room is significantly better. Now, when you look at what this team's problem is, with this, it's, it's a lack of depth. And, and for me, it's one simple reason why this team has no depth, and it's the draft since 2011. And it's not, it's not what they've done in the draft, because if anybody who's ever hired employees, you're gonna miss, like everyone, you think you're gonna hit a bullseye with every hire, you're just not. So you're gonna make mistakes in the draft. That's a given. Not everybody's gonna be great. Well, first of all, they've made what I would estimate one great pick in the last six years, and that's not enough, and that's Teron Armstead in the third round. You've got to hit on your first round picks. You hope to hit on more than one guy beyond the first round, and then to me, what the real problem with the, this team's lack of depth is the trading away of draft picks. This team has a crazy idea towards trading two to get one, trading up in the draft. They did it twice this year, traded up to get Von Bell, gave two picks to take one. They traded up to get David on Yamada. Now look, those two might turn out to be good players, and at this point they certainly look like it, but you're given two for one. Since 2011, they've given away seven picks like that, right? Plus two that the NFL took away in the bounties, and those were two twos. That's nine picks that weren't misses. And you've had your misses. You've had Stanley Jean-Baptiste and Kyrie Ford and Ronald Powell. You're going to have misses. And sometimes in the draft, even when you're right, you're wrong. Like P.J. Williams was a third-round pick, and Damian Swan is a fifth-round pick. Those two, by every objective measure, are good picks. Those are good players for where you got them in the draft. P.J. Williams in two years has played two games, obviously got the horrible concussion. Uh, Damien Swan has played seven games. Injuries are going to happen. That's like a natural thing. So sometimes even when you're right, the injuries are going to hit you and you're not going to get the value out of the pick. So to give away seven picks, and that's nine total, to give away nine picks in this age, because with a team that has salary cap problems and a team that has a ton of dead money and you made mistakes like Junior Gillette, the draft is the great equalizer. These are the players that come at a bargain. These are the players that are salary cap friendly and you're not taking nine of your darts. And I looked it up just to see the New England Patriots, the poster child for how to do things in the NFL. In the last three years, you should get 21 picks, right? Seven a year. They've made 29 picks. While the Saints are giving away picks, the Patriots are stockpiling. Because I think they understand if you, you're better off with nine extra darts to hit a bullseye. 
And so while the Saints have given away nine, the Patriots have picked up eight extra. That's 17 guys different, just 17 shots. So how does New England lose Tom Brady and still go three and one? Well, they take Jimmy Garoppolo in the second round, and then two years later, they take Jacoby Brissett in the third round. Why? Because they've got 17 extra picks to play with. That's the kind of things you can do. So to me, that's the one thing about the Saints since 2011, the second Super Bowl run, the one that didn't get you there, but should have. The one thing they've done wrong is giving away your shots. Um, I will say this, when I left training camp, I thought this team would be better than they are. I, I speak every year to the uh, crew of Carrollton Carnival Club, and when I got back from training camp, I said, look, I think this team's gonna be a little better than people think. I think they can be nine and seven. I think they can compete for a playoff spot. Of course, at that time, the cornerbacks were Keenan Lewis and, and Delvin Bro, and Delvin Bro has a chance to be an elite player in the NFL. And then the number three was P.J. Williams, and the number four was Damian Swan. Now you're playing without all four of those guys, which is a series of just bad luck at one position that I'm not even sure how drafting would you really have drafted three more cornerbacks because that's what it would have taken. It's a series of bad luck. I still think the Saints are going to be in a ton of games. You can see in three out of four games, Atlanta's the only game that they really weren't in it at the end. There, three of the other four could have gone either way. You're going to have a bunch of those. I think once Delvin Bro gets back, he is one guy that can literally can make a difference. You watch the first three quarters of that Oakland game, and the difference in the defense when he's in the game and when he's not is completely different. Now, he'll get back soon. He potentially could even be back after the bye. I would doubt it, but I wouldn't put anything past this guy. Of course, everybody knows his story. He came back from a broken neck. This is just a broken leg, so it's not nearly as bad. Um, he will make a difference when he comes back. Sheldon Rankins will make a difference when he comes back, although that's further down the line. But when Delvin's back, you can leave him by himself on one side and help a lot more on the other side than you can do right now. They haven't been able to do that. I still think they're going to be competitive for most of this year. Obviously, for everyone in this room has seen what a Super Bowl team looks like. That's the one disadvantage right now. We, we know what a Super Bowl team looks like. We know this is not that just based on what we've seen. But I do think this team can be competitive. I think there's going to be a lot of games like the ones we've seen so far. Look, thanks so much for having me. Anybody got any questions? I know we're getting the limit of when people have to get back to work. Anybody got anything? Thanks for having me, everybody. Thank you.